Welcome into uh, today's Trib Chat. He's Kurt Cragthorpe. I'm Gordon Monson. We're sports columnists, right, Kurt? That's what we do. That's Supposedly. what we're here for. Yeah. Yes. We're uh, Kurt's the expert on sports, and I'm. I'm what are monkey. you anyway? I'm the monkey in the box. That's what I am, I guess. <laughs> anyway, why don't we go ahead and get started here today? Start with what we saw with the Jazz last night. Kurt, you want to lead off on that? Sure. A couple observations. Number one, it was fun. I've been wondering if it was going to be fun to watch this team play, and it was. Now, whether that lasts for 82 games, we'll see. But the number one observation I had was the Jazz shared the basketball. And I will say that Al Jefferson grew on me a little bit the last few years, but it was so refreshing not to have somebody with their back to the basket pounding the ball into the floor working for a shot. The, the Jazz moved the ball. They had... 18 baskets in the first half, and 16 of them came via official assists, which was a great sign, and it just made it a lot more fun to watch. Now, as I talked about yesterday in a in an unscheduled appearance on Trib Talk, the Jazz will be in a lot of home games. I think last night was a, a good example of, of how they're not going to get run off the floor in their home building. In fact, if you're down 15 at Oklahoma City, for example, the game's over. But if you're down 15 here, you, you still have a chance. And so in terms of people going to home games, they're, they're going to get a, a decent contest most nights. Now, the issue that I also talked about was whether the Jazz can actually finish these games when possessions become vital and scoring becomes more difficult, and, and that obviously proved to be their downfall last night but but overall it, it was a fun night and I and it it gave me a, a more favorable impression of this team than I had going in I will say that and the, the, the last thing I'll say is that uh, if you were to say who was would be the four worst teams in the NBA you you might pick Philadelphia the Jazz Phoenix and Orlando and Philadelphia beats Miami last night Orlando rallied to take Minnesota into overtime on the road. The Jazz could have won, could have won, and Phoenix did beat Portland. So it kind of tells you what the NBA is like. It's it's not like college football where the the bad teams get killed every week. You're you're gonna put yourself in a chance to win some of these games, and and the Jazz did that last night. They just couldn't quite finish it off. Man, I'll tell you my observation off that game last night is it went exactly the way. I think a lot of games are going to go this year, especially against the better teams. I mean, there was strong effort on the part of the Jazz, uh, a lot of hustle. Uh, they tried to play defense. They tried to share the ball. They uh, they made a lot of mistakes. I mean, when you have John Lucas stepping out of bounds at, on a critical possession, I mean, that's sort of the thing that's going to happen. You saw Gordon Hayward had a tough night. I really didn't expect that so much. But that's going to be interesting to keep an eye on as the season goes on. But uh, but the mistakes, when you have 22 turnovers and you miss 10 free throws, I mean, that's the difference in the game right there. You know, and uh, this is something, another thing I think the Jazz is going to face a lot this year, Kurt, and I don't know how you feel about it, but I think they're going to be called for a lot of fouls, especially against the star players. I mean, that's true every year, it seems like. But when the referees look around and say, who's Mike Harris, you know, I <laughs> think, Okay, I'm going to blow my whistle, and I'm going to call a foul on that guy. You know, that, that's going to happen a lot this year. But the Jazz, a lot of effort, uh, some really bright moments, as you talked about, sharing the ball. I th there was no stick to the ball last night, and that, that, that was so refreshing to see that. And then there was strong effort at the defensive end. It didn't always work out the way the Jazz wanted it to, but still, Strong effort there, and I think the crowd loved it. I, didn't you, Kurt? I think I think people were enthralled by that, and so we'll see if uh, if that's enough to keep people really interested in what's going on. Yeah, and you talk about the point guards. John Lucas actually had a pretty good first half until he totally messed up the last possession and shot a three-pointer way too early that, that gave Oklahoma City a chance to go down and make a three, which made it a nine-point game. Now, obviously, the Jazz did recover from that after he got a little worse first but but yeah the point guard the, the one wish I had coming out of last night was that it would have been good to have Trey Burke in the lineup obviously he has the broken finger and we will be out a few more weeks presumably but 
But every game he gets to play and be in that closing situation is the kind of experience he needs. And and what's going to happen, realistically, is that once he is in the lineup and gets those chance to finish games, the Jazz are going to go through the same things that they went through last night with him because it'll take him a while to, to learn how to finish games at this level. But that, that's that's the downside of that injury. But but overall, it was fun. The, the, the Mike Harris thing was interesting. I, I made about four notes of fouls <laughs> uh, when the Durant got favorable calls. But then, just to not quite even it out, but to somewhat balance it, it was, it was shocking when Durant got called for the foul of Harris on a three-point play, three-point shot that gave Harris three three throws, and those were big at the which time. Was a, which was a foul, by the way. Slap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but you, you would think that Durant would have to uh, bodily injure him <laughs> for, to, to have that call. But, yeah, I, I, I definitely had the same impression that uh, the, the Jazz are not going to get a lot of calls, and, and Ty Corbin's going to wear himself out with his sideline dances trying to protect his players in that regard but yeah it was overall it was it was just a fun night and yeah we, we don't know how, how long the fun's going to last but I, I think what you can say is this the Jazz are going to win about half of their home games so if you're if you're buying tickets to the game you have a 50 percent chance of seeing the Jazz win and about a 90 percent of chance of them seeing be seeing them be competitive now on the road watching the games on TV you might have to avert your eyes much more frequently than that, but in terms of coming out and responding to the crowd and, and playing hard and, and, and doing giving themselves a chance to be in the games, they'll, they'll do that at home. I'm pretty sure of that. I want to get back to Gordon Hayward, Kurt, because, I mean, th- there's been so much talk about him being a leader on this team and him feeling that, but sometimes when I watch him play and even when I hear him talk and watch him interviewed, he says he talks about leadership, but he almost parrots back what it sounds like he's been told rather than it coming naturally to him. I wonder how much of a role that's going to play as far as his development goes this year because he he looked like he was processing in his mind that he's the leader on this team, but it didn't necessarily have a positive effect on him. He didn't shoot the ball well. He made some errors. Uh, I, I wonder how that's going to turn out for him. Yeah, I, I think possibly the contract situation that goes down to the deadline tonight might have played on him a little bit. I thought early in the game he was excellent. He, he, I, I can pick the spots on the floor where, where I pretty much know Hayward can make a three-point shot, and the corner is not one of them, and that happened to be the shots he was getting late in the game, which was late in the shot clock as the Jazz were kind of running out of options on those possessions. So that that's when he when his failings really showed up as, as on those corner threes. But when he's he was on the right angle or the left angle in the first half, down on my end of the court where I'm watching the game from, he, he looked like he was taking those shots in rhythm and, and, and making them. So so it's hard to try to capsulize the forty eight minutes and make too much judgment about him. I will say this, as a sophomore at Butler, he was the leader of that team. So I think it's not a stretch to say by year four with the Jazz, he can become the leader of this team, particularly as you look around that locker room and, and see the void that exists in that regard. So I, I think Hayward's going to be fine. I, I just think those possessions at the end of the game that were so critical just kind of got scattered, and, and he ended up kind of being the scapegoat forced to take bad shots for him. Wasn't that three-pointer at the end uh, a, a ghostly reminder of what happened in the Final Four? I, I bet if you traced an arc <laughs> from here to Lucas Oil Stadium, that, that shot was on the exact same angle, just about uh, 15 feet closer, and uh, basically had about the same chance of, of going in. And I'll, I'll bet if you also had the footage of Hayward just wheeling slumping for a minute and walking off the court, it would look exactly the same as it did that night in Indianapolis. Yeah, I bet that's true. You know, there's a difference between leadership and having a closer, and Richard Jefferson was talking about that after the game. He said this team does not really – there's no one guy to go to. Meanwhile, Kevin Durant is scoring, what, 15 points in the fourth quarter and leading his team to victory, essentially. The Jazz don't have that, that guy uh, and Richard Jefferson was talking about every different guys on different nights stepping up. Now, that sounds good from a team standpoint, 
but you wonder how much that's going to hurt the Jazz, and you wonder if they can develop a closer. I mean, Alec Burks looked pretty good last night. I don't know if he's capable of doing that all the time. If he could develop a jump shot in addition to his athletic moves around the basket, man, he would he would make himself a lot of money in the NBA. Who do you think is the most likely guy to become a closer of those presently on the roster? Yeah, I, I still think it probably is Hayward, actually. I, I the, If they had to do some of those possessions over again, I think what they would do is get the ball in his hands out front rather than, I don't know how he ended up on the corner on, on a couple of those. And, you know, the other thing about Oklahoma City is, yes, Durant scored a lot of points, but but the Jazz outscored them in the fourth quarter. So if, if you're a Thunder fan, I think you're saying, we didn't close that game great. It was just maybe you can give them credit for playing defense because the Jazz had that stretch of eight possessions where they only got three points. But but Durant was what was he nine for twenty four? I, I wouldn't I wouldn't say that he had a a great offensive game or a, or a brilliant finish. He just he did make his free throws, which which was critical. But in in a in a basic sense. You, you can't really say that Thunder outplayed the Jazz down the stretch. They just didn't lose the lead. Yeah, if the Jazz had made free throws and not turn the ball over. Oh, look who's here. It's yeah, Brian. Hey. Welcome to the party, man. Sorry. I didn't want to jump in. You guys are on a roll. so <laughs> We kind of are. Hey, uh, sorry about that. Jeez, you guys don't even need me. Um, sorry, I had some technical difficulties from home, but I'm, uh, I'm here. I rushed into the office, and we'll keep it rolling. That was impressive, so. actually. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you kind of talked about it a little bit, but Burks, Burks kind of was the, the star that shone the brightest last night. I mean, he had 24 points, just kind of went off. Um, is, is that? Do you think he can sustain that? Is that kind of a concern that he was sort of the leader coming off the bench, or is that good to sort of have that spark plug guy that kind of be your sixth man and, and come off and score when you need him? You know, Brennan, I talked to Alec Burks about that uh, just uh, before the season started, and he was he's so eager to have that opportunity to show what he can do. And I, I think there are certain athletic elements he can bring to the team that are uh, exceptional, really. Uh, I just wonder if he can just develop that, that outside jump shot the way Kurt and I were talking about it. And I don't know whether shooters develop shots or not. Jeff Hornacek used to say they can. He said he used to shoot with two hands kind of in a flipping motion like this, and it screwed his shot up, and he learned to, uh, to, to straighten that out, and it made all the difference for him. So maybe Alec Burks, if he gets the outside shot in complement to the rest of his game, he could be something really special for the Jazz, and that's the kind of thing that the Jazz have lacked for so long, that kind of contributor, that kind of guy who can create his own shot. And it's great the Jazz had 25 assists last night. Would the Thunder have, Kurt, like nine or something? And yet the Thunder end up winning the game. It kind of is a blow to team basketball. But there are moments when it's really good to be able to just hand the ball over to a guy and let him work his wonders. Sure. Kurt, I want to ask you the same thing. I actually saw a tweet last night. I was watching Twitter about Mike Harris. Somebody joked that uh, maybe he should be getting the Gordon Hayward extension. Uh, 13 points, four rebounds last night. I mean, he he was just a pleasant surprise. What did you see from him that uh, kind of stood out to you, and, and were you surprised that he was a contributor right away? How about shocked? Yeah. Uh, if he hadn't had his name on the jersey, I'm not sure I would have recognized who he was. That, that was an amazing performance. He also defended Durant really well. So it just it kind of shows you there's a lot of basketball players out there in the world, and if, if guys get a chance, they can really take advantage of it. And that, that was kind of the ultimate example of that. That was, that was really a strong performance from him. He, he was not afraid to step up and take some shots in the fourth quarter and just did a great job. So who knows what his future is, but, man, he – he probably bought himself a year in the league with that effort last night. Sure, absolutely. And that was a that was a that was a career yeah. high by the that was a career high by the way, Brennan. Yeah. Thirteen points. You right. know, so the, it's it's not like this is something this guy does on a regular basis. But who knows? Absolutely. Uh, just in general, I don't know if you guys touched on this last night, but did we underestimate the Jazz? I mean, they were in it right till the end. Favors kind of missed those two clutch free throws, and if he made those, they they might have won that game. Um, Gordon, I want to start with you. Do, is there, do we underestimate them, or is it is it way too early to tell with just a one-game sample size? 
Well, obviously, it's a small size to be able to draw conclusions from, but uh, but I think we talked about this a little bit earlier, Brennan, and it's this. Jazz fans are going to see what they saw last night a whole lot, especially on their home floor, they, and they're going to lose to some of the better teams, but, man, that, that was fun. Kurt keeps using the word fun, uh, and that's what that was. I mean, watching a bunch of youngsters out there busting their humps, playing as hard as they could, trying to figure out and discover – who they are, you know, and that's that. That so many times, I think what fans get the most sick of is watching guys making ten, fifteen million dollars a year out on the floor, not busting it. And these guys are going to bust it. They're going to go out and give everything they have as often as they possibly can. And it's not good enough to win games like that against the Thunder, or at least it didn't work out that way last night. So I think that's going to happen a lot, but. It's still what this season is really all about. It's not about the win total this year. I'll say it as an anomaly this year for the Utah Jazz because it's never been this way before. But this year is more about the development, about learning who these guys are, not just from the team's perspective, but from their perspective as individual players. That's what's going on here, and that's why it's so much fun to watch. Absolutely. And, Kurt, you know, I'll just kind of piggyback question off of that. Is it almost an underrated storyline that these guys really have the opportunity to form an identity? And with that, there's, I guess, the lessened expectation or the less pressure. There's pressure on them, but it also gives them sort of the free will to make this team how, what suits their talents best. Yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good way to phrase it, Brennan. Uh, you know, all, over on the facade of Energy Solutions arena right across the street from us, there's a phrase that create history, and, and that, that's kind of a, a grand way of saying what these guys have an opportunity to do this year, and the low expectations do play into it. I mean, it felt like the Jazz overachieved last night, and, and the, the vibe in the arena was that this was a pleasant surprise, that they were staying in the game, but it, as I talked about with you yesterday, that's kind of what the NBA is like. Home teams rarely get smoked on their home floor. So so the Jazz or anybody else, the 76ers last night against Miami, they're going to be in these in these home games. And so if your baseline is just hanging in there, that you're going to be rewarded most nights at home. So the two issues then become can you when you're down 15 on the road, are you actually going to fight back and get within a point? That's harder to do. And then the home part is, if you're down 15 and get within one, can you actually go ahead and finish that off? Those, so those would be the two issues. But, but for right now, there is kind of this period where just playing hard and, and being fun to watch gets you a long way. Sure. Absolutely, guys. Well, yeah, fun to watch. It was a great game last night, and too bad they couldn't pull it out, but it really gives hope for the future. So I kind of want to shift gears now. Let's talk a little college football. It's It's been a little while since uh, Utah and, and BYU played, but it's almost like they're, they've kind of parent trapped switched potential right now. Um, BYU's ripped off five straight, and Utah's lost two in a row on the road. Gordon, I want to start with you. Uh, at USC, they didn't score a touchdown for the first time since 2010. Should Travis Wilson have started that game, and what's plaguing the Utes right now? Well, I think Travis Wilson was hurt. Uh, that, 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 I, you know, everyone talked about. I thought Kyle Whittingham was really rather rough with uh, Travis Wilson after that game. He said, "Hey, if you're if you're if you're out there, then you're then you're not hurt." He was hurt. Something was screwed up with him, and you could tell it by the flight of the ball. I mean, it was obvious to anybody who was watching it. And some of it might be mental as well, and some of it might be schematic, and some of it might be the fact that the tight ends are gone. I mean, there's all kinds of things you can look at. But uh, Travis Wilson, I think, was dinged up to the point where where it w was truly affecting his delivery of the ball. And I don't know. I've never. I'm not a quarterback, but if you have a sprained index finger, doesn't it seem like maybe that might affect the flight of a ball. I mean. It's he, he didn't look right to me, and I'm not making excuses for him, but uh, I talked to, at length with Dennis Erickson yesterday, and Utah is so funny about talking about injuries. They're just sort of, they freeze up and they get real vague whenever you start talking about injuries, but uh, I think he was sort of admitting in a real sort of opaque way that 
Yeah, that some of it is physical with Travis, and 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 when he plays well, the Utes are a different team. Absolutely, uh, Kurt. I, I want to pose you the same question. I mean, obviously that that hand's really bothering him, and and it hasn't gotten better. I mean, should he have taken this week off, or is it just too much to ask of Adam Schultz to go into L.A. and beat USC even in a down year? The answer to each question is probably yes, in hindsight. Uh, I don't think Schultz was ready to, to go in and win that game. USC's defense is good. You know what it is, kind of is, is a NFL mentality, and and coincidentally or not, Dennis Erickson was an NFL coach, but you'll notice in the NFL, the, bat, the starting quarterback basically has to be dead for him <laughs> not to go out there on Sunday. It, it's um, and he, Even if he's, he is dead... It might be like weekend at Bernie's. They'll try to prop him up anyway. <laughs> that, that's just it. It all you, you hear coaches say this all the time. Who gives us the best chance to win? And so obviously their their decision was that even if Wilson wasn't perfectly healthy, that that he gave them what they thought was the best chance to win. And there, there's he says, and there's some back up to it, that he, that he was throwing the ball reasonably well in practice, but, but as Gordon says, it just wasn't working in the game, and, and then it becomes this vicious cycle. They, they couldn't run against a good USC defense, and Wilson couldn't throw well enough or be protected well enough to uh, loosen up the defense, so it, it just became this vicious cycle that you often see on offensive side of the ball that, that, that no part of it works, and, and so it all ends up looking bad, but but it, it's unfortunate because the Utes did waste a nice defensive performance, and so now they're in that regrouping mode, and, and to, uh, to probably segue into what you're talking about as you introduce this subject, it, it is amazing how the perception of BYU and Utah has changed right now. I mean, if, if you just said, let's say, three weeks ago before Utah played Stanford that they'd be 4-4 four and four right now, that would that would seem pretty reasonable. But now they're four and four, and it's, it just seems like they're in this uh, horrible tailspin that you wonder if they're going to get out of. But but with two weeks off, it might be a, a brand new team that takes the field next week against Arizona State. We'll see. Sure. And, and Gordon, it's it seems like that win over Stanford was years ago, let alone three weeks ago. Uh, how did the Utes kind of right this ship? The defense has been solid. I mean, they they gave up those yards to Kadeem Carey two weeks ago, but generally they. They're carrying the team right now. Is it all on Wilson, or is there other ways the Utes can kind of eke out these wins for the last few weeks of the season? Well, eking out a win against uh, explo an explosive team like Arizona State and then having to go up and play the Ducks, uh, I, I don't really even want to think about that uh, right now because that doesn't sound very appealing for the Utes, that's for sure. But the offense does have to put it together, and like Kurt mentioned, the offensive line has to has to play better. I mean, it's Travis. Well, it's not him alone. The finger needs to heal, and he needs to regain some confidence. Dennis Erickson needs to call some plays that Travis Wilson is really good at. You know, every quarterback has has certain plays that they they really like because they 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 can execute that play. So he needs to dial into that and and build his quarterback back up if that finger can get healthy again. And, and so but you can't do anything if the offensive line isn't blocking. And when the Utes were trying, I mean, Travis Wilson was the only guy who could run the football against USC. And so that's going to have to change because the run game sucked too. I mean, it wasn't just the throw game. The, the, the Utes gained 201 yards against a good defense, but Stanford's pretty good defensively as well. So, I mean, is something went wrong, and that's that's got to be repaired. The problem going up against Arizona State is that that is a that that team is going to score a lot of points, even against a tough Utah defense. And so, can the Ute offense match that? Uh, that is a very big question right now. I'm almost certain they can't match what Oregon's going to do. Sure, sure. And luckily, again, the Utes had this week off, and they'll have some time tonight. Uh, ASU plays Washington State and they'll have some time to scout that out. Uh, Kurt, I want to kick it over uh, to BYU. Uh, five straight, like, just talking about, this isn't the Boise State of 2006, but Boise State had won 50 straight games in the month of October and 21 straight against Utah teams. Uh, how shocking was the, the BYU just 
not just a win, but they really just dominated the Broncos um, last week. Yeah, it, it probably shouldn't be so surprising at this point because you have to say that the BYU offense has played at this level for five weeks now. It was surprising in the sense that if you looked at Boise State versus Utah State, even with Chucky e. Keaton out, you would have thought that if, if BYU could roll up all those yards on Boise, that Utah State at least could run the ball and have some success against Boise's defense, and, and that was not the case. So so people who, who understand defensive line play were pretty impressed with Boise. But, man, down in Provo, they, they looked like just an average Mountain West team playing against a, a good team in BYU. And, and I have to, to say that the BYU's offense has impressed me. Now, I'm starting from from the baseline of that game in Virginia in late August when they looked completely futile trying to move the ball. But they've they've won me over in, with that offense. It, now, a lot of people are talking about what's happened in some third quarters when they've bogged down a little bit and maybe been too conservative, but the numbers are pretty impressive. They're scoring in the high 30s every week. They're, they're getting 500 and 600 yards every week now, and Obviously, going to Wisconsin will be a, a different dynamic, but but to this point in the season, that that offense has improved so much that I'm I'm really uh, taken aback by it. Sure. And Gordon, uh, Taysom Hill, 339 yards through the air, three touchdowns, uh, one touchdown on the ground, zero interceptions against Boise State. I mean, we sat here a month and a half ago saying that he shouldn't even be starting. Um, what What's kind of changed for him, and, and has he turned the corner to be the best quarterback in the state now? Well, what I said about Dennis Erickson and what he needs to do for Travis Wilson, I think Robert and I deserves a lot of credit because his play calling was favoring plays that Taysom Hill could execute. And so, and then all of a sudden he started hitting 40-yard bombs and they were right on the money. So it's funny how the psychological aspect of sports, uh, it seems as though once he got a little momentum going, then he could not only complete the easy throws for him, but also the more the more difficult ones. And, uh, man, I, I tell you, we're all, I'm guilty of uh, underestimating what Taysom Hill could be. This kid is a stud, and there's no telling what the top end might be for him. This is a work in progress, and it's very good news for BYU because everything that happens on the field down there, even on the defensive side of the ball, starts is initiated by that quarterback at BYU. That's just that's the way it is down there. And when they have a quarterback who's dangerous, suddenly the entire team becomes more dangerous. With with one little word of caution though, I wonder what the Cougars record would be if they were playing the same teams the Utes are playing. Sure. Uh, and I don't mean to diminish anything. I mean, they, they crushed Texas. They ran that. They punched that team in the mouth and ran them off the field. Uh, and Boise State is a, is a, is a fine program, uh, but having a backup quarterback in a down year, not really, not really the Boise State that we've come to know. That's why these next couple of games uh, against teams like Wisconsin and Notre Dame are going to be so informative about where BYU is right now. And uh, w and then we'll be able to measure the, 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 the progress that that team is really making. But it seems pretty obvious that uh, Taysom Hill has it going on, and uh, as as a result, the Cougars do as well. Sure. And, and, Kurt, I think we all discussed this. Just that as soon as his arm could catch up to his legs, uh, he'd be a real threat. And that's that's something that's even scarier moving forward. It, again, we have to – they haven't had the toughest schedule, but – as far as read option goes and, and the evolving offenses in college football, Hill's a great weapon to have. Uh, how has he turned the corner? I mean, what do you see from him? Is it attributed to a nice offense, or is it just him really growing into his own? I just see the guy I saw glimpses of last year. I, when he was going through that stretch in August and September and he was completing one-third of his passes, I kept saying, what happened to the guy that was 24 of 36 against Utah State as a freshman. And lo and behold, we, we're seeing that guy now. So so I'm not going to say I, I knew he was going to do this. I was just wondering why he wasn't doing this year what he did last year. 
and uh, so obviously he has that ability. So it's, I guess you could, you could probe into what the heck was wrong with those first three weeks when obviously he, proven now that he did have the ability. So and and obviously BYU would love to replay those games, which they cannot do. But in a sense, as as Gordon mentioned, these these Wisconsin and Notre Dame games are of such magnitude that they can almost make people forget about Virginia and Utah if they, they win either, either one of those games, much less both. You know what's interesting about that, Brennan, by the way, is that uh, I think BYU matches up nicely with both those teams. Wisconsin likes to have a – they've got that Gordon kid there who can really run it. They like to play power football a little bit, and BYU's defense, that front, is pretty effective in that regard. So that'll be very interesting to watch how that goes. Absolutely. Okay, guys, and I just want to touch on uh, it's a, it's a big week for soccer too in Utah. Um, RSL is is playing the Galaxy. They have to go on the road Sunday. Um, not the best track record in big games, Kurt. Uh, Real Salt Lake kind of drops it when it matters, but. What do they have to do to get over the hump with the Galaxy and get to the Western uh, Finals? Yeah, keep in mind it's a two-leg series, so sure, sure. they're playing Sunday in, in Los Angeles and then the next Thursday here. And so basically what you would say, and it doesn't historically always work this way okay, yeah, coming back, but, but if somehow they, they come out of even in Los Angeles, then, then they'd be well positioned. Now, Theoretically, they, they should have been able to take advantage of that with Seattle last year and, and failed to do so. But but I, I think RSL has a 50-50 chance of advancing from this thing. But but you're right. There is kind of this asterisk on the franchise now. Keep in mind, they did win a championship once. Sure. Uh, but the, as the years go by, that that'd be, that'd be, seems further removed. And, and they've been so good for so long that you do expect more of them in the postseason. And and the other part of it, of soccer or any pro sport is it's so postseason driven that, that yes, the regular season was nice, but this, this is the part that counts, which is kind of strange to say after they've been literally playing eight months of regular season soccer to have it all potentially end in, what would it be, 180 minutes of soccer in those – two legs of the first round series is kind of stark but but that's the nature of it and Jason Christ has done a nice job and and to, to finish second in the West and to be in c competition for the best overall record in the league going into the final weekend was pretty remarkable but what teams are remembered for is is how they perform in the postseason and so I, I really think there's a lot at stake for RSL in that regard sure and Gordon, again, you know, they've kind of been a model of consistency, but just like most of the teams in the MLS, it seemed like they were allergic to trying to win the Supporters' Shield at the end of this year. Uh, the Red Bulls ended up taking that. Um, do they have momentum going into this game, and how do they beat the Galaxy over two legs? Uh, well, on that last question, it reminds me of, uh, I hate to get personal here, but uh, I before I married my wife 31 years ago, her father was a very wise man, and so I went to him and I said, uh, what is the secret to a, to a happy marriage? And I was expecting this profound response, and uh, he's a wise man, like I said, and he looked at me and he said, uh-uh. <laughs> Uh, uh, I, I don't know. I don't know. They have to score more goals than uh, than the Galaxy do. And it, it, it's weird, though, because I've watched that team quite a bit this year, and it seems as though when they trust each other, you know, when they when they, when they they just play soccer, it seems like they, they do a lot better rather than when you see them clench up a little bit, tighten up, and, and then weird things start happening, you know. So I, I think uh, Jason Christ is probably telling those guys, go out and be who you are. Uh, do what we practice with that diamond formation and just just go out and play soccer and win the game. And I, I think that's sort of what they have to do against a team like the Galaxy. Absolutely. Okay, guys, well, I kind of want to close it out on this question. Um, I had my welcome to being a Utah sports journalist moment uh, last week when I said that if they played on a neutral field right now, BYU would have a great chance to beat Utah. And obviously we can't live in hypotheticals. Utah's won four straight. 
But, Kurt, I want to kick it over to you with how Wilson's played. Um, would would BYU have a legitimate chance to, to take this game if it was played later in the season, like seasons past uh, for the rivalry game? Yeah, and, and again, you, you use the, the word hypothetical very well, so I'll, I'll emphasize that in saying this. But two things come to mind. One, this is a dramatically different BYU team than we saw in September. It's just like saying, would they beat Virginia if they played again? Absolutely. Would they beat Utah if they played again? Yes, they would have a great chance. And I would remind people in, in saying that, that they had a great chance in September. So obviously they, they didn't take advantage of that. But they, they had the ball at, at what, the 27-yard line on that fourth down play where Michael Walker made the interception in a seven-point game. So... So obviously not that much separated those two teams at the time. BYU, again, has dramatically improved. So, so yeah, absolutely they would have a very good chance of winning if they were to, to meet again. But as, as I said, going into that game, until they do... Uh, Doesn't matter. It, right, exactly. <laughs> sure. Gordon, I'll ask you the same thing. Uh, Ute fans weren't too happy when I posed that on Twitter, but I just... Uh, want to see how you feel, especially with sort of the direction both teams are going in uh, right at this minute. Well, would, would BYU beat Utah? Uh, I don't know. I've forgotten what that's like. It's been so long since, uh, <laughs> since the Cougars have beaten the Utes. Uh, look, the answer to that question is which Utah team is going to show up, the team that beat Stanford or, or the team that looked embarrassing against USC and Arizona. So uh, if, if the Utes are healthy and, and, and if Travis Wilson can throw the football, uh, it's hard for me to go back and say, oh, yeah, BYU would beat Utah now because they did. And, uh, and we haven't seen that for a long, long time, even though I know Cougar fans like to think that it would be different. But, and, and I agree with Kurt. BYU is better. And a lot of that, as we've talked about, has to do with Taysom Hill and the confidence that he's building up. But... Based on my experience of what I've seen in the past, I mean, Utah didn't lose to BYU. So why all of a sudden would they start losing to them now? I, I'm, I'm not sure I can stretch my imagination quite that far. Absolutely. Makes sense. Okay, guys, we'll wrap it up. But uh, Utah gets ASU next week, BYU, Wisconsin, and Utah, the Jazz are looking pretty good. So it looks like it's going to be an exciting rest of the season. Uh, thanks for your time. Sorry for being late again, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thanks, Greg. All right. Thanks, Thank Gordon. you, Brennan. All right. Thank you.